And I'd just like to call your attention to these posters that Kit uh, Kedridge has brought to us. These are, these are drawings done by children in Gaza, children of Gaza that every day have drones that are above them also. As in the tribal areas of North and South Waziristan in Pakistan, and in, in uh, the areas of Afghanistan, and in Gaza, and in Yemen, and in Somalia, U.S. drones are flying 24 hours a day in these areas. And these kids have the horrors of war with them all the time. And while these pictures were, were made right after Cass Lead, I believe, the 22-day attack that killed 1,440 people in Gaza, wounded 5,000, left 50,000 homeless. That was, what, three years ago? Three years ago. And yet drones every single day are, are above Gaza. And the kids can hear them as the kids in Pakistan were telling our delegation, we hear them, mm -hmm. and they never know when the next sound that they're going to hear is, is a crack of a rocket, a hellfire rocket as it's fired toward their, for their house or toward the, to, the, to the house of the neighbor. They never know who's going to die in, in their villages that next day. Uh, they never know whether the people that come to rescue, those that have been um, hurt or killed, that the buildings have fallen down on them, whether, whether or not that next Hellfire missile will be purposefully targeted into that house to kill the rescuers. That's what the United States is doing in Pakistan. They don't know whether if there's a funeral party that's taking a person who's been killed in a drone attack, taking them to the cemetery to be buried that within that 24 hour period, that, that, that funeral party will be attacked by drones because in Pakistan, we do attack them. We attack funeral parties. And in Gaza, where these kids live under that 24 hour a day buzz and when there are drone strikes that are happening each week in Gaza. In Gaza, a place 25 miles long, five miles wide. 1.7 million people live in Gaza. It's one of the most densely populated places in the world. It's being attacked every day by the Israeli Defense Forces. From the Israeli side, they say, well, there are rockets that are being fired from Gaza, and there are. And 99.9% .9 of the people in Gaza don't want those rockets fired because they know the response from the Israeli uh, Defense Forces is going to be brutal, that it will be definitely a disproportionate use of force. It will be, it will be horrific if with, when those missiles start going over, those homemade rockets that fortunately don't, generally don't hit anything in Israel, but there have been Israelis that have been killed. But the disproportionate use of force that comes back on the people of Gaza uh, is horrific, and we saw that in the Operation Cast Lead. Right now, the United Nations says that by the year 2020, Gaza will be unlivable. That the blockade, the naval and land blockade that the Israeli government has had on, on uh, Gaza since, uh, since 2007, now going into its fifth year, almost the start of the sixth year, is really strangling the country. After Cass led the 22-day attack where the Israelis purposely attacked the industries that were in Gaza, destroying them, and attacked the civilian infrastructure to include the water treatment plants and the sewage plants, where now the water is mostly not drinkable, and the aquifer under Gaza is being siphoned off by the state of Israel for its golf courses, for its yards that are in the, the um, settlements, the settlements in the West Bank even that look like Southern California, the homes in Southern California. The sewage system that has been destroyed and the parts for it has not, have not been able uh, to be brought into Gaza, where now 80 million liters of raw sewage go into the, uh, to the Mediterranean every single day that area of the Mediterranean where the people of Gaza, the fishermen of Gaza, who are trying to bring fish in, fish for 
for protein for people of Gaza, where the Israeli military is squeezing them, squeezing them, squeezing them closer into the shore, where essentially anything off, the, the fishermen can't go more than two miles offshore. So they're fishing in these polluted waters. The fish that they catch have been in these polluted waters. The people of Gaza that are desperately trying to maintain a life, to say to the world, we're not going to give up. We, despite the pressures that the Israeli government, which hand in hand with the United States government, are putting on us, that we will survive this somehow. You know, the Israeli government has said at various times, ministers of the Israeli government have said, we're putting the people of Gaza on a diet, that we're not going to allow uh, more than 10% of the, the amount of goods and food that normally are needed to, take, to keep a population of 1.7 million people alive. We're not going to send in but 10% of that. And for the last many years, most of the things that have come into Gaza have had to come through the tunnels, smuggled in through the hundreds of tunnels that, are, that have been dug under the border with, with Egypt. But the people of Gaza, despite all of this, are saying, we will survive. We will continue. We're not going to be starved out. We're not going to just turn over and say that we, we are nothing that our, our, the human dignity of the people of Gaza is something that has impressed me beyond belief, and that they are responding in generally a nonviolent way to, very, to a lot of violence that's being wrecked upon them. You know, the, the international community, I mean, there are a lot of us that, uh, as citizen activists from the international community, have been trying desperately to figure out how we can make sure that the plight of the people of Gaza is not forgotten. And starting in 2009, with the, uh, at the very end of the Israeli attack on Gaza, several of us went to Gaza right after the attack ended and miraculously got in. Medea Benjamin of Code Pink Women for Peace and myself went at the very end of the attack and saw in a 24-hour period the, the destruction, the devastation that had been wrecked and swore that we would come back and bring people back to Gaza. And over the next six months, there were seven delegations that, were, that, that came uh, from the United States and from other parts of the world to Gaza. In fact, Kit Kedridge was on their very first group that came into Gaza, and then she herself led several different groups into Gaza. And the, at the end of 2009, we orchestrated what was called the Gaza Freedom March, where 1,300 people from 55 countries came as far as Cairo, Egypt, to try to join into Gaza, go into Gaza in solidarity with the people of Gaza at the, in commemoration of their survival one year later of the Israeli attack. The Egyptian government eventually only let 100 people from our delegations go in. Uh, the, during the, in the lead up to the Operation Cast Lead, there have been other people that have been trying to um, bring the attention, the plight of the people of Gaza to the world community. And those, those folks decided they were going to sail tiny little boats into Gaza. And in the summer of 2008, they actually sailed five boats. And for some reason, the Israeli government allowed them to go in. It was the first boats that had been into Gaza City Harbor in 41 years. 41 years. And this group of people known as the Free Gaza Movement had fundraised all over the world to buy these tiny little boats that went in. And actually, the chronicle of what they did and how they did it is now commemorated in a new book called Freedom Sailors. Freedom Sailors. And we have copies of it right here. And half of the proceeds of the copies of that book will go to our next project, which is Gaza's Ark, which we'll be telling you about. But after, after Operation Cast Lead, as the Free Gaza Movement started sending more boats into Gaza, the Israeli Defense Forces boats, big boats, started ramming the little boats, almost sinking them. And at that point, Free Gaza said, we, we, we'd better stop sending one or two boats. If we're going to send boats, we need to have a lot of boats to really give the 
Israeli Defense Forces a run for their money. And that's where in May of 2010, if you remember, that was the very first Gaza, Gaza uh, Freedom Flotilla. And the, the six ships that were a part of that flotilla were attacked. And I'm sure you'll remember that the Marvi Marmara, the Turkey ship that had 600 people on it, it was lethally attacked. Israeli commandos started firing live ammunition on people on the top deck of that boat from helicopters. And they were firing weapons up into the stern of the boat. I was on a little boat that was off to the side of it, the Challenger 1. And we witnessed the initial attack of the Israeli commandos on the Marvi Marmara. By the time the commandos finished, they had killed nine activists. They had really executed nine activists. Most of them were shot at very close range. Eight were Turkish citizens and one was an American citizen, a 19-year-old boy named Furkan Doan, who was born in Troy, New York. His parents were there as exchange or graduate students in Troy, New York. He was shot five times, five times. The United States government has said, we will not investigate his death. We are relying on the investigations done by the government of Israel. Well, after the, the attack on the, the Freedom Flotilla in 2010, there were, there were only 17 Americans that were a part of that flotilla out of almost 700 people, 700 people from around the world and only 17 Americans. And, those of us Americans on the flotilla, when we came back to the U.S., we said, we, are, we want to be a part of the next flotilla, and we want to have our own boat. The U.S. boat to Gaza is what we'll call it, um, and we'll fundraise all over the country to get enough money to buy this boat, which we did. And in May of last year, we had 30 passengers, 10 journalists, and 10 crew members that arrived in Athens, Greece on what we call the audacity of hope. That was the name of our U.S. boat to Gaza. To say right back to the Obama administration, as with every other presidential administration, that uh, we disagree with the U.S. policies on um, protecting Israel no matter what it does. That the United States policy really is to protect Israel. And Israel is doing some things that are endangering the national security of the state of Israel as well as the national security of the United States by our protecting them. So we called on the Obama administration to stop this. We called our boat the Audacity of Hope. Well, you probably remember that the Audacity of Hope and the other eight boats that were in Greece uh, were, were um, subjects of uh, a campaign by the Israeli government to the Greek government that we, that to not let our boats go, to find every little safety inspection violation, and to use that to say, your boat is unseaworthy, it's unsafe, and you cannot leave the shores of Greece. Well, actually what it was, it was the Israeli government twisting the arm of the Greek government and actually paying them off, paying them off with special trade concessions and. We don't even know all of the aspects of what they paid the Greeks to keep those eight boats at the shores of, of Greece. Well, when you get 50 activists, 30 activists, journalists, crew members on board a boat, and they've come there to challenge the Israeli policies and the U.S. policies, what do you think happened when it was the Greek government's policies that were keeping us at shore? Do you think they had any more respect, so to speak, for those policies than we would have had if the U.S. government in Washington had told us we couldn't stand in front of the White House for whatever. Well, no, we didn't. And so off we went. We said to the Greek government, well, we didn't say anything to them. We threw off the lines of the boat and off we went to sail to Gaza. And we got about three miles offshore until uh, the Greek Coast Guard arrived with commandos with weapons pointing at us that stopped us and eventually turned us back around and put us back into the port of Keratsini next to Piraeus and that's where our boat still is. The Audacity of, of Hope is still on a Greek pier that's co-owned by the U.S. Embassy and the Greek government. Well, 
just because that boat didn't, those boats didn't go, didn't mean that this was over. And uh, Kit Kitteridge was on the next boat that tried to go into Gaza. In the fall of uh, 2011, uh, the Canadian boat called the Tahir was somehow able to get out of the port in Crete and picked up passengers in Turkey and Kit was our American delegate on that boat. Kit is right back here. Kit, how about wave to everyone? Yay. <laughs> Kit was on that boat and ended up spending how many days in the Israeli prison? Four, four days before she was deported. Uh, you know, these deportations are 10 year deportations. Uh, it is, you know, for people that want to work in the West Bank, uh, going on one of these boats is something that you have to really, really think hard about because if, when you're deported from Israel, it means that you will not be able to go back into the West Bank. You can still get into Gaza through Egypt, but you can't go back to the West Bank. I will be on the next boat, uh, the, the Estelle, the, the Swedish boat to Gaza, and we'll be trying to get in, break the Israeli blockade next week. Um, we don't know how many more boats will be going to try to break the blockade from the outside in, but we also have another, uh, uh, another initiative that uh, is breaking the blockade from the inside out. And that's what I want to end this talk with. And that's right up here we have it. It's called Gaza's Ark. We, we are fundraising right now to purchase a boat that's already in Gaza. It's one of three fishing vessels that's large enough for us to convert into a cargo boat and we're going to renovate that boat using wonderful professional mariners that they have in Gaza. You know there's a Gaza City Sailing Club. Did you know that? In these tough times there's still people try to re, try to keep with normal things and you should have a sailing club. You're right on the Mediterranean Ocean and even though there are Israeli boats that are two miles offshore that are going to push you back or shoot at you if you're a fisherman, it doesn't mean that you can't tr keep trying to keep hope alive for the kids and have little tiny sailing boats that they can sail close to shore so that they can enjoy the Mediterranean even though it's a bit polluted from all of the sewage that's in it. So we're going to use uh, professional mariners and, and boat builders that live in Gaza City to help repair this. We're going to pay the three families that own this boat a, a very good price. I mean, it is their legacy. It's what their money's tied up in. So we don't want to jip them. We want to pay them a reasonable price. What we're trying to do in the next four or five months is to raise a $120,000, a lot of money. A lot of money. None of us have that kind of money, but dollar by dollar by dollar as we get contributions from people that think that it is important that we continue to challenge the Israeli policies as well as the United States policies in the Middle East, that we will get this money raised. I have no doubt about it. And what we're going to do with that cargo boat is to ask you all to help us fundraise for that, plus very quickly, we're going to have up on our website, the website which is called gazaark.org, we're going to have a catalog up there for you. A catalog of products that are made in Gaza. And you think, well, what is made in Gaza? Well, there's beautiful Palestinian, uh, Palestinian embroidery. In fact, Kit has a beautiful scarf that's right back there. And if you remember the beautiful vests that have embroidery on them and dresses and there's all sorts of handicrafts that are still made there under these very difficult times. And our website will have a picture of the vendor, the person, the craftsperson, and what their crafts are and how much they're selling them for. And your money will go directly to those people that you decide you want to buy from this person, that person, that person. And the, the website will get the money directly to them and then they will put your name and address on the wonderful, beautiful bundle that they will wrap up for your goods. And then probably at the end of the summer, next summer, the early fall, when the boat is renovated and ready to go, we'll have a very public ceremony in Gaza City and we'll ask all of the, all the craftsmen to bring down all of the packages that have been so neatly and beautifully wrapped up for you 
with your address on them, and they will bring all of those down to the cargo boat, and we will carefully place them in the cargo hold, and then we will have Palestinians and internationals on that boat, and we will sail the boat out. Yay! We, we will break the blockade of Gaza from the inside out. Yes. Okay, now here's the bet. How many of you all think we're going to get very far with this boat? How many people think that we're going to get all the way to a port on, uh, on the mainland of Europe? Well, okay, there are a few. <laughs> How many of you all think we might face a little bit of opposition from the Israeli Navy? I'll raise this hand on that one too. <laughs> well, so what happens if they stop us and they take the boat and they take your goods? You've paid for them, they're yours, they're not the Israeli, the Israeli government's good goods. What do you think we're going to do? We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna sue them. We're gonna sue them. We're gonna take them to court in Israel for thieving our stuff. And we intend to use war lawfare just as uh, they have used lawfare in trying to keep our boats in the ports in Europe. We're going to turn the tables on them. And we're gonna take them to court on this. And then the next question is, what do you think our prospects are for getting the stuff back? Well, we don't know. We do know that, uh, sadly, uh, Rachel Corey's parents, Craig and Cindy Corey, for the last two years have been suing in civil court in, in uh, Israel for justice, for justice concerning the death, the murder of their daughters as a IDF soldier operating an American D-9 Caterpillar bulldozer ran over Rachel Corey in March of 2003 in Rafa, Gaza, and then backed over her body again, killing her. And her family finally being able to sue an Israeli court, demanding that the young man and his commanding officer be in the court to testify. And they were actually in court, although no one saw them. They were behind blinds. And tragically, about a month and a half ago, the verdict of the Israeli court came back, which was that uh, the Israeli government was not going to hold anyone accountable for the death of, of Rachel Corey. But to the credit of the parents of Rachel Corey, they used the court system to keep alive what had happened to their daughter and to other internationals who have been desperately trying to help the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. And the line continues from Israeli court for Rachel Corey to who's in prison in Gaza, those 9,000, pardon me, who's imprisoned in Israel, the 9,000 Palestinians that are still imprisoned there, even though 1,000 were released with the release of the one Israeli soldier held in Gaza. There are thousands and thousands of people that are being administratively detained for years, no charges against them. So going into Israeli court is, is very important for us to keep alive in front of the faces of Israeli citizens that indeed there are injustices going on that they need to be aware of. They need to face too what their government is doing. And suing in Israeli court is one way to do that. The question is, was the Palestinian fellow who was on like, he was on like his 50-day hunger strike because he was being administratively detained. Uh, he is alive, and in fact, uh, the, the reason that he is alive is that uh, the Israeli government finally uh, saw that he was going to, he was going to end his own life it, if it took that, to keep the attention on the fact that all of these hundreds of people, thousands of people are being administratively detained. He did end the hunger strike um, with the stipulation that I think it was two weeks later that he was to be released from administrative detention. And I, unless somebody has any different information, I believe he was released on the timetable that, he, that had been agreed to. Yeah, but, but another sign of peaceful nonviolent uh, uh, methods used to try to affect change in Israeli policies. 
question is, uh, is the information about drones, the use of drones, more, uh, um, more available, or do more people internationally know about the use of drones, uh, and particularly U.S. drones uh, being used in, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and other places? Uh, that's one part of it. And then the uh, domestic use of drones. I would say for sure the rest of the world knows exactly what's going on with the use of drones. And that's what is causing one of the elements of uh, greater anti-Americanism all over the world. Uh, the newspapers from all over the world carry every, every strike that there is. You know, there have been two strikes in Pakistan, two, uh, two drone strikes since our delegation left. One of them killed 16 people. And of course, our paper says, if you can find it in your paper, I mean, in the New York Times today had a little article about one inch long about the two, two drone strikes. The rest of the world knows much more about it. Domestically, you know, the, the drones are one of, it, it's the weapon of choice now for the United States. The, the U.S. military says we love it because nobody of our group gets hurt on it. We don't have to put boots on the ground, so to speak, so we can just go up there and kill anybody we want to, and there's no after effect except that's not true. I mean, if you look at the numbers of people that are being killed in Afghanistan right now, they're not being killed uh, with a large number. More people are being killed in the U.S. military now by Afghans who we have trained and equipped, who are turning on the trainers, who are killing American soldiers right in the training base. You know, the last three months, there's been something like 40, 40 American and NATO soldiers being killed by people turning weapons directly on them versus being killed out by the Taliban out in other areas. And I would suggest that one of the reasons that so many people are being killed by our own, the people we've trained, is that these people know people in the tribal areas. They know families that have been killed by these drones. So I think the blowback is already starting on those. In the United States, um, since, uh, we now have over 500 companies that make drones. We now have a drone caucus in the U.S. Congress because it's such a big deal. More and more of the U.S. military might is going into these drones where we now train more drone operators than we train fixed-wing pilots for our aircraft. We have about 150 intel anal analysis or analysts who are doing work on the data that comes back from the drone surveillance. 24 hours a day, those drones are surveilling areas, and all this data comes back to Air Force bases all over the United States, uh, whether it's Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri, where a good friend of ours just received a six-month federal pen sentence for putting one toe over a line at Whiteman Air Force Base. Brian Terrell was sentenced today to six months in the federal pen for putting one foot, one inch over the entrance to Whiteman Air Force Base. His letter to the judge, or his sentencing statement to the judge, is beautiful. It is a, a real tribute to uh, freedom of expression, free speech, the right to challenge the government, and then seeing the government turn on the people and sentencing under things like this. So I hope that it, you will read that. It's in Common Dreams and Truth Out right now, his statement. Uh, we, in the United States, we have a situation that uh, the U.S. Congress has now uh, ordered the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, by the year 2013, next year at the end of it, they have to identify six areas, isolated areas in the United States where the FAA will start practicing integrating drone, drone flights into commercial airspace. And by the year 2016, the FAA has to figure out how to be able to integrate 30,000 drones into commercial airspace. 30,000 drones that could be flying right up alongside of your commercial aircraft. And needless, needless to say, the Aircraft uh, Pilots Association is one of the biggest groups of people that are challenging that. Well, it's a very good question. How, how many of the drones are really operated from the United States, and does it make those bases uh, 
perhaps a target for uh, for actions against by people that don't want these drone strikes to take place. Well, the U.S. military operates its drones, the ones that operate in Afghanistan. Those are operated from the United States in places like Creech Air Force Base, uh, uh, Hancock Air Force Base in Syracuse, New York, Whiteman Air Force Base. Uh, the CIA operates its drones from from an air base in Afghanistan now. Previously, it was operating them from a Pakistani air base, and the Pakistanis threw them out of that. Uh, the ones that are in Yemen and um, Somalia are generally operated through the Joint Special Operations Command. And I'm not sure whether those are actually operated from the United States, or they may have um, an operational site uh, that's in Djibouti. But the question of, does this then make a target in the United States for those bases where the drones are operated from? Well, the 28 of, or 34 of us that got arrested at Syracuse Air Force Base last April, that was exactly the argument we were using in the court, is that these drones are jeopardizing uh, the Syracuse, New York area that people will find out that that's where the drones are operated for, for that are attacking in, in Afghanistan, and that they may, the drones may come home to roost, as they have in Israel. Just two days ago, here's a report that a drone was shot down by Israeli Defense Forces. And in today's news, Hezbollah from, from Lebanon has said that was one of their drones that they were flying over Israel to check out what was going on, we don't know where. Could be over the Israeli nuclear facilities. Uh, the earlier report said that there have been three other times that drones have been shot down or, or crashed in Israel, and one of them crashed into an Israeli naval boat. So these things, are, the proliferation of the smaller drones is very easy. The larger drones, like the Predator and Reaper, they cost several million dollars a piece, 25 million probably. Um, but the smaller ones that are, that are small enough that soldiers can carry them in their backpacks, take them out, open them up, put them together, and they, their wingspan's about like this. But they can have explosives on them. So these are the types of things that can be very easily put together and flown anywhere in the United States. Uh, against U.S. interests in the United States, much less interests like U.S. embassies around the world, U.S. military installations around the world. The United States is really using this program at its peril. We've now sold $1 billion worth of drones to NATO countries. $1 billion worth of drones. This is big business. Uh, Israel, the second larger producer of drones, has now sold $100 million worth of drones to Russia. And if you think the United States is, uh, you know, we're trying to get away with droning Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, and Pakistan, well, the, so the, the Russians, they have some places they'd like to drone, you know, the areas of Chechnya and other places like that where they don't even have to put their boots on the ground using the same argument as the United States. We, they'll just fly those drones anywhere they want to kill people in, in those areas. The human rights abuses, human rights violations that the United States has done, of course, will be replicated by many other places because the U.S. got away with it, so we'll get away with it, is, is the rationale. Other questions or comments? What about China? Well, China has now put forward prototypes of 25 different drones. Um, you know, they've got a big, they can make anything fast. <laughs> and uh, uh, they, the production of them uh, has not reached a proportion that we know that they're actually exporting them. But in order to get their foot in the puddle, so to speak, uh, two years ago at one of the big air shows they have in China, they brought out the prototypes for 25 different drones. So they're getting in the business. Uh, she's saying, have we heard about a program the U.S. military has where they take fifth and sixth graders to military bases and teach them about science and math? I'm not surprised to hear about that because the re recruiting techniques that the U.S. military uh, has uh, infiltrates uh, all levels of education. 
Remember when they had the Army Experience Center in Philadelphia where in a, in a commercial shopping center they set up a big game store, a game store with U.S. military equipment in it and inviting the kids to come in and learn how to shoot this weapon and kill that person. And, and then they had a party room so you could have your birthday party at the Army Experience Center. And it took us about six months of getting arrested about once a month before finally uh, they closed down that center because of the publicity that citizens had about it. So these sorts of things are, are worthy of, uh, you know, the militarization of our school system is uh, something we have to really be vigilant on. And, and taking them to task on this uh, uh, is, is very worthwhile. One of the things that we did, or uh, Shahzad Akbar did uh, prior to our arrival, was to contact uh, some government agencies in places where he had been unable to get an invitation to speak about drones. And he used the fact that some of us had a military and State Department background to say to the National Defense University of the government of Pakistan that we have people coming in from the U.S. that want to talk about U.S. national security and drones and to the Institute for Strategic Studies and the Institute for Policy Studies, a conservative think tank. And because it was somebody coming in from the U.S. to talk about U.S. national security and Pakistani national security and drones, uh, he was able to secure speaking engagements for us. So I ended up giving three different talks to these very high-level think tanks, something that I've never been invited to do for our own U.S. government think tanks. I've never spoken to our National Defense University in Washington, D.C., or the Army War College, or the Navy War College, or to, to the Institute of Peace. But he was able to use the fact that we were coming in to get the issue of drones on their agenda. And when we went to speak, and then the, uh, the message was something that was challenging U.S. foreign policies and U.S. military policies, they were kind of stunned because they said, we, we get lots of American speakers, but they're all brought here by the U.S. Embassy, and we've never heard quite that version of U.S. national <laughs> security. Yeah. And we got invitations to come back to speak from all three institutions because we said we've got a whole raft of people in the United States that are challenging U.S. government policies and would love to come and speak to you. And they, many of them have tremendous backgrounds. All of them have tremendous backgrounds. And we can, we can uh, supply you with a lot of speakers. So that's one thing that the continuing relationship will be that there will be a lot more Americans who are challenging U.S. government policies uh, that will be going to Pakistan, we feel. Well, it's a very good question, and uh, let me make sure that I mention that I do put a caveat on what I say, that I don't represent all of the American people, because we do have a, a, a debate here in the United States. Uh, while now we have 70% of the Americans finally saying after 12 years of being in Afghanistan that it's finally time to kind of end our involvement there, we don't have that same number of people of Americans that are saying that we need to end the use of drones. And I'm very careful to say that. But what I do say is that the dialogue, the discussion is increasing in the United States. And when we have conservative newspapers like the Wall Street Journal on the 26th of September have a front page article that starts out uh, U.S. Uh, what was it? U.S. Uh, ponders drone policy. And then a full page in the center section of the, of the Wall Street Journal that is one of the most extensive discussions of Pakistan and, is, and American uh, uh, relationships on these drones. And when we have in the New York Times large articles about the drones. So I'm careful to, t to say that, that we don't represent all of America. But we do represent a reasonable number of Americans who are challenging U.S. policies of war in Afghanistan and are trying to work to end that, and that we believe firmly, a group of us, uh, that the drones and the use of the U.S. drones in Pakistan is destabilizing 
uh, Afghanistan, and it, as well as Pakistan, and it is harmful for, for U.S. interests in the long run and the anti-American feeling. So I am careful to put that caveat on there. Um, but I, I in no way think that just the presence of one retired Army colonel s saying this is going to influence the whole policy debate uh, in a way, one, you know, one time and that's going to be it. But what I'm trying to say is that at least we got a little toe in a door that we've never had open to us before. Our question is, isn't that one of the reasons that we're using drones so that we don't put our own soldiers in there? And it's a very good point. I mean, it is, it is a government's way of saying, we may not need you humans anymore, that we are going to do all of this by, uh, by remote control. And so we're taking you out of the equation so that you won't be influenced like Dan saying some people are. However, the drone operators and the drone analysts, the intel analysts, those are people too that, that uh, are, are suffering uh, in some ways, just like combat, people that have been in combat. There are now, there are drone operators that are now getting treatment for post-traumatic stress because they're actually watching what they do. They watch that drone missile, that drone Hellfire missile go into a house. They see it collapse. They see people come and try to tearing it apart and then they may see the body of a little kid being brought out or they target this motorcycle that's going along and it blows up on them and then they may read a couple of days later that those were 14 year old boys that they weren't the militants they thought they were. So the, I think the, U, the U.S. is trying to sanitize war. They're trying to take the human element out, out, out of it by using uh, these drones. But the human element still is a part of it. Well, uh, two young men who've been a part of the IDF, who've been on various boats, have been trying to break the uh, naval blockade of Gaza, Yonatan um, uh, Shapira and his brother, uh, have been on two different boats that have tried to break the blockade and uh, they are treated pretty badly by their fellow IDF guys. In fact, Yonatan, Yonatan himself was tasered in the heart by his IDF buddies when they came on to the last boat that he was on. Yonatan was on our crew of, of the U.S. Uh, boat to Gaza, the Audacity of Hope. So yes, we're trying to reach out uh, to, uh, to Israeli citizens, to IDF members, um, to give them the opportunity to challenge their own government's policies. Mm -hmm.